so people can copy what works, not just study the pathologies. And ninth, and this one will obviously be fit uh, my personality, <laughs> or, at least, or at least my experience. Do not shy away from controversy. This is a choice between two value systems, two power structures, and two visions of America. Conflict is inevitable, and direct, blunt debate is desirable. That until you're prepared to engage the issue of personal strength and talk honestly about what it implies, you're not going to get anywhere. And that, by definition, is going to be controversial. Now, let me give you some examples. I would suggest that in American civilization, that Americans favor work over idleness, saving over debt, family over individual chaos, helping your children over abandonment, responsibility over irresponsibility, learning over ignorance, and responsible citizenship over indifference. Now, and in every case, my, my, my point, this is not just nice words, my point is, in each case, the law and the government should favor the former over the latter. That is, you ought to literally go through the tax code, the welfare code, the bureaucratic rules and regulations. You should go through the entire structure of government and say, are we sending signals that favor work over idleness, that favor saving over debt, that strengthen family over individual chaos? that give you an incentive and a, and, and a legal structure to help children rather than abandon them? How are we doing this? Or in fact, do we, without even realizing it, send the opposite signal? Go to work and we'll tax you and we'll kick you off Medicaid. Save and we'll raise your social security uh, taxes. Try to get married and the earned income tax credit will take $4,600 away from you. Try to adopt a child and it can cost up to $50,000 to adopt a child. So they're trapped in foster care, and they're trapped in, and, you know, people attack me over the orphanage argument. This is a society which has artificially made it expensive to adopt children. Just the opposite of a good, strong, pro-family environment. Now, the reason I said that we should look at the law and the government is because the law is a great teacher. And I really don't think you, you can fully appreciate the power of this. You know, when, when a teacher is saying, you ought to work hard, and out in, out in the uh, yard there's an illiterate drug dealer driving a Cadillac. Then the law is tolerating a lesson to be taught, and no matter how often you say it in the classroom, it's not going to work. So you've got to structure the law so that you are learning from your government and society what you wish to teach in the classroom. And if the classroom is teaching one thing, and government and society is teaching another, you should assume that at best you're going to have conflict and at worst that the ultimate reality of the society will drown the classroom. Doesn't do any good to say, let's teach it to them if the law doesn't teach it to. And so you've got to think about the law as a teacher. In addition, frankly, leaders can be teachers. It's very, very important to recognize that leaders play a very, very important role and that the way they model, what they say, where they go, is a very important part of this process of teaching. Do you go to the Boy Scout Jamboree or not? Do you, do you go to the Girl Scout National Meeting or not? Do you think the Salvation Army is important enough to visit or not? What, what, how does a leader spend their time, and where do they go, and who do they see, and then what do they talk about? These are important factors. I, I wear a Habitat for Humanity pin. I understand the other night that in uh, Saturday Night Live that the person that caricatures me also had a Habitat for Humanity pin on. But I'm sending a signal. I'm saying Habitat for Humanity is a good program, and that others ought to have a pin too. You pick the program you like, but tell me what you're doing that's important. Because these are signals. They matter. They communicate. Um, public symbols and awards can teach. That's why the thousand points of light wasn't a bad idea. That's why when, when you find ways, you know, as you'll see later on, we talk about Deming and quality. Creating a Baldridge Award at, the, at least created a sense of looking at things. You know, people say, wow, them, they must think quality is really important getting a scholarship, having a star student. These are good things to do because they help the society talk to itself about what, what it values. And again, we come back to the core point about why civilization matters. That uh, civilization must be learned so values must be taught. And for Americans, personal strength must be at the center of those values in our civilization. So if you go out and you start with Head Start and you look at the curriculum, how much are we emphasizing personal strength? How much are we communicating? If you look at the way government bureaucracies work, how much do they talk about personal strength? Olasky makes the point that when you have 200 uh, cases and you're a welfare worker, 
you have no personal contact. That in the 19th century, because it was all volunteer, the average was one to one or one to two. You actually knew the person you were trying to help. At 200 cases, you're filling out the paperwork and sending the check. So how can you teach personal strength? And so you've got to really think it through in terms of how we teach these things. Now, I want to take, for the next few minutes, one of the two people who I think is at the center of the revolution in American productivity and success in the 20th century. He's actually, interestingly enough, an Austrian by birth, came to the U.S. Uh, in the, early 19, the late 1920s, uh, still alive, still writing in his mid-80s, uh, has an article out this month in the Atlantic Monthly, in the February edition, called Really Reinventing Government by Peter Drucker. And it's just fascinating to me. Here's a guy who in his, in, I think he's now like 85 or 86, still teaches at Claremont College, still writes, clearly the greatest management writer of the 20th century. He and Edwards Deming, who I'll talk about in a little bit, who died at 93 while still teaching. They're exemplary models of the idea that in the information age, our whole sense of aging is going to change, which as I get older, I think is cool. 